This nation was founded on the principle that all men are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men. That all men are, are created, created equal. I'll tell you what freedom is to me. No fear. I mean, really, no fear. It's a death. From WDET in Detroit, this is Created Equal. I'm Stephen Henderson, and with me in the studio is the show's producer, Carrie Jr. II. How are you doing? Pretty good. So today, we want to talk about a subject that we have talked about a number of times, actually, here on Created Equal. And it's really kind of a, a fundamental issue for the, the mission of the show. Uh, and that's what the wealth gap is uh, between white Americans and African Americans. And it comes up in a number of different contexts. Mm -hmm. But today we want to talk with an author who's written a book called 15 Cents on a Dollar, which quantifies what that wealth gap looks like, that for every dollar of wealth white Americans have, uh, black Americans only have 15 cents. Um, it's an incredible statistic. And so I'm really, really eager to try to dig into that and see where that comes from. But also, uh, what are the things, what are the levers you might pull to to close that gap? I feel like I've heard this statistic before, right? Like this is not this specific line. Is this new? Is this something they generated? It's it's a government uh, it's a government statistic. It okay. comes from uh, a study that the government conducts uh, about wealth, um, and yes. and so it's it's a pretty unassailable number. I mean, it's looking very specifically at assets right. that uh, that black families have compared to the assets that white families have. In the book, what they do is they try to kind of personalize it through some narratives. Uh, they really take a look at. Um, uh, different parts of the country, the country and, and things yeah. that people have tried to do in different parts of the country. Uh, there were two authors of the book, uh, Ebony Reed and Louise Story. Um, we're going to talk with Ebony uh, today about uh, about their work. Yeah, they are both journalists and media, media professionals, and they crossed paths at the Wall Street Journal uh, back in 2020. They said in a previous talk that the protests— uh, the Black Lives Matter protests are what inspired this book. Yeah, yeah. So let's get to uh, Ebony and this uh, conversation about America's wealth gap. Ebony Reed, it's great to have your voice with us here in Detroit and to have you here on Created Equal. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be with you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So um, I want to start with uh, this idea. Uh, we know that the wealth divide between black and white communities exists. Uh, but you suggest in the book that a lot of people misunderstand that gap. Um, so I, I want to start with what you think that misunderstanding is, and I guess what prompted you to try to explain it in uh, in a better way so more people actually understand what we're talking about when we refer right. to it. I think, yes, there are a lot of misunderstandings um, about the gap, which you know, bear out in, in, in data and in surveys and also um, things that my brilliant co-author Louise Story and I have learned from having uh, racial wealth gap symposiums across the country since February. And we've been teaching a class at the Yale School of Management that we uh, co-designed for the last three years. I will start with the data. There are surveys out there that show that white Americans, more than 40%, think that the black-white wealth gap like doesn't exist, went away, has been dealt with. Mm -hmm. Then there are, um, there's also data out there that shows a similar percentage, slightly less than 40% of Black Americans know there's a gap, but they greatly underestimate it. Um, there is confusion in the public between the difference between income and wealth. Um, wealth is everything that you own um, minus everything that you owe. That you owe, right. <laughs> that is the Federal Reserve definition. It is your net worth. And... Um, you know, when we start talking with people about the wealth gap, and I think other people will find this as well when they read our book and they start to talk to their neighbors and their friends and their church members, 
pay attention to whether or not someone starts to talk to you about income. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a very common thing where people might say, well, I sit next to someone at work or I know someone from the plant where I work and, you know, we all have the same wages. You know, what are you talking about? Well, that's income. That can be an input in your wealth, but income and wealth are two different things. Um, and so I think that sort of speaks to, you know, the, the misunderstanding or the lack of understanding about wealth to begin with. And then when we start to share with people that, you know, a typical black family has 15 cents in wealth for every $1 a typical white family has in wealth yeah. based on Federal Reserve data. It, people's minds are blown, Stephen. I mean, yeah. you can you can you can hear the gasp in the rooms. You can see the look on people's faces. You know, <laughs> I shared a bookmark with a guy, you know, a few months ago on a, a flight, and I was telling him about it. You know, because Louise and I tell people everywhere we go about this, and he was like, "Oh, is that a statistic from like the 1890s?" And I was like, "No, that's no. from today." That's from 2024. But, right, right, and that was just mind-boggling to him. Yeah. So so let's talk about what what makes up that gap. I mean, a little bit I want to go back and talk about kind of where it comes from. But uh, what what are the things that mm-hmm. white Americans have and have access to? that make up this 85 cent per dollar gap with with black americans what 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 are the things that make that make that true well the number one thing that makes it true is that they have more money mm-hmm. like you know wealth is something that people don't just pass down to their generations when they pass away you know if we think about it a person who's wealthy is more likely to be able to give their children money toward a down payment on a home. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to be able to pay for their child's college education and not have that child saddled with student loan debt at the undergrad or graduate level. So the number one difference is that, you know, there is a large amount of money in this country that is not in the hands of Black Americans. And so... Um, they, they're they not able to pass it on to future generations. Some other differences between Black and white Americans, you know, home ownership has been, mm-hmm. you know, a major uh, contributor in the, you know, in the past to building wealth in our, our country, one of the ways. Um, black, black Americans have a home ownership rate around, you know, 44, 45%. White Americans are up around 75%. Um, I like to also talk to people about some of the things that have happened historically in our country that have impacted those percentages mm-hmm. because those numbers just didn't just like pop up from yesterday. Um, you know, and, and one example that I talk about is, you know, what happened with um, the GI Bill yes. and Black Americans who were veterans. Yes. You know, the GI Bill was set up in our country to help all veterans who had fought in World War II, regardless of race, to be able to buy homes, start businesses, go to college. Yeah. And Louise and I, we interviewed you know more than half a dozen families in this book who told us about experiences their loved ones had, their grandfather, their great uncle, um, who could not use the GI Bill. Yeah. And in some cases it was, couldn't use it because... Um, they went to the bank and they were told, well, these homes in this neighborhood where you want to buy have restrictive covenants. So you can't even own property there. In some instances, they were told just no. In some instances, they told us they didn't even try because they were so afraid because you have to remember, you know, well, you don't have to remember, but you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of violence yes. um, in our country at that time. And we document that, you know, in our book that there were few safe places where Black Americans could own homes and feel safe. So, you know, that contributed to their, you know, Black Americans who were veterans not being able to take advantage of a benefit in Mm. our country to build wealth. And so the GI Bill helped create um, the white middle class in our country. And there's some estimates out there. I wrote a piece for the LA Times about this. There's a professor at Middle Tennessee State University that's also done some research on this that, you know, less than 3% 
of uh, Black veterans were able to use the GI Bill to purchase a home. And, you know, um, Lewis Woods' research has looked at the fact he's crunched some numbers that that he says that if Black Americans were able to equitably use the GI Bill, our country might have another, you know, he estimates north of 400,000, um, you know, homeowners, yeah. uh, you know, today. You know, let's just stop for a moment and think about that, Stephen, <laughs> exactly. you know. Exactly. You know, I, I tell this story a lot and, and people who listen to the show have heard it before, but I mean, it's an important story, and and your uh, your reference to the GI Bill is is a reminder of it. Uh, you know, my father um, was born in Mississippi in 1933, um, and uh, grew up, and then joined the Air Force during the Korean War, and went off to to you know fight for his country like uh, like other people. Uh, when he came home uh, to Mississippi to Natchez. Uh, he, you know, he couldn't access the GI Bill. He couldn't go to school uh, because African Americans weren't admitted to the University of Mississippi at that point, right? Uh, and and mm-hmm. other uh, other colleges there. He couldn't buy a home because of those kinds of restricted racial covenants. The places where uh, the banks in Mississippi were going to to you know uh, use GI Bill money uh, for veterans didn't include neighborhoods where black people could live. Um, you know, and I always say this is not some ancient relative I read about in a book somewhere. Right. This is my father. This is the first yes. man I knew and whose life shapes mine, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is all this is all part and parcel of what we see today in terms of just again, this difference, this gap between black and white. Let me tell you something uh, that blew my mind that I found out in researching this book, because, you know, this book, 15 Cents on the Dollar, How Americans Made the Black-White Wealth Gap, will take people of all backgrounds on a journey. You know, as you're reading about the seven main people that we focus on Mm -hmm. and you learn about who they descended from, it will cause you to think about who you descended from (laughs) and and what the financial journey has been for your family. And um, in the research for this book, there was a moment where I was so exhausted, you know, and sad after like collecting some really horrible and sad family stories. And I said to one of my aunts, I said, you know, I hope someday that I meet a descendant of a black GI who was able to use the GI Bill to buy a home. Mm -hmm. So like that 3%, Mm -hmm. right? And she said to me, we were on the telephone. She says, well, Ebony, don't you remember that your grandfather, Robert Reed, fought in World War II? And I said, well, I knew he was a veteran. I couldn't (laughs) remember the war, Stephen. You know, I was a little girl. I was maybe a couple months shy of turning seven when he passed away. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, my parents moved to Detroit, you know, in the 80s for, you know, better opportunities. We had a brief stopover in Erlinger, Kentucky, which um, I have a passing reference to in the in the book um, because it wasn't a great experience for us racially. And that's one of the reasons we came to Detroit area to be in a place with more diversity. And so my aunt said to me, she says, your father, your grandfather, use the GI Bill to buy the home that you used to visit in Newburgh, Kentucky, when you were a little girl. Mm. And I was stunned. I said, he did? And so I tried to probe a little bit and find out, like, how was my grandfather part of this 3%? And no one really understood what or how he was able to use the GI Bill, like how he was able to do it when so many people weren't able to. But, you know, he died, like I said, when I was a little girl. And my grandmother would go on and live in that home for decades. They had paid, you know, roughly $9,000 for this small home. When she got ready to sell it, she sold it for like nine times the price that they had initially paid for it. Um, As she was like approaching, I want to say she was like probably in her mid 80s. And she moved to another part of Kentucky to be near other relatives. And so my aunt talked to me about how they were able to leverage the equity in that home to help pay for her first year of college. 
Now they didn't, you know, you got to also remember too, like at this time, you know, there were few safe places where black Americans could own property. This is 1954 when they bought this home. So they settled in a community that on the outskirts had been settled by Eliza Tevis, who was a black woman who had been formerly enslaved and bought black children out of slavery to give them a safe place to be. Hmm. So they had found out about this community somehow, they had moved there, but my aunt made sure that I understood that because of restrictive covenants, because of discrimination, because of redlining, because of all these things, they couldn't just go to any place and buy a home. That's right. And so then that would restrict you know, the value of the home that they could buy, which then had an impact on the amount of equity that they had. And so by the second year of her being in college, they had run out of, there was no more money to give her. So she had to come home and and recalibrate and think about how she would pay for, you know, college. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, Okay, we need to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to continue this conversation with Ebony Reed uh, about the black-white wealth gap. We'll be right back with more Created Equal. We're back with Created Equal from WDET in Detroit. I'm Stephen Henderson. I'm talking with Ebony Reed. She is a chief strategy officer for the Marshall Project and a lecturer at the Yale School of Management. She is co-author of the book, 15 Cents on the Dollar, How Americans Made the Black-White Wealth Gap. That's what we're talking about, uh, the difference between African Americans and white Americans when it comes to finance and wealth. Uh, Ebony, I want to spend a little time talking about both the past and the present and how they shape uh, this gap. Uh, and and I, I, I'll be a little more explicit about what, where I'm going here. Uh, okay. Obviously, a lot of what we see today is rooted in things that happened a long time ago, right? Uh, mm-hmm. After after slavery is uh, uh, abolished, uh, there are all kinds of New barriers that are put up in front of African Americans that that um, that uh, that contribute to 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 this gap, but mm-hmm. we also still live in an America where the things that happen today make that gap harder to close, if not mm-hmm. impossible. And and uh, the example that I'm thinking of here is real estate, which we were we were talking about a little in the last mm-hmm. segment. But when you think about a city like Detroit, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, th- this was um, in the 1950s and 60s uh, home to the largest concentration of uh, African American single family homeowners uh, in the country. Right, once they remove mm-hmm. racial covenants in neighborhoods, uh, you get a-, a flood of African American people buying houses, um, and yet. Uh, 40 or 50 years later now, uh, so many of those houses, which should be the basis, the foundation for wealth for those families, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. They should be worth multiples of what they uh, paid for them back then. Uh, They have no value, right? Um, Mm -hmm. uh, You can buy many of these houses uh, for the price of a new Ford uh, right now in, in, in Detroit. And so, it's not just that uh, African Americans were held out of uh, being able to buy real estate for such a long time by discrimination. It's that even once we were able to buy that real estate um, because of uh, white flight, because of disinvestment in cities like Detroit, because of all kinds of other factors, that investment doesn't pay in the same way that it does for white people. So I guess I want to have you sort of draw some connections between that history and what we see happening now. There, There is, you know, data and research out there that speaks to um, home values and that Black Americans tend to own homes 
that are worth less than white Americans Mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. So I think that is probably in the mix of part of that um, explanation, you know, as well. And I'm also thinking of something that um, Emmett Pearson said to me, he is the CEO of the community builders of Kansas City okay. that works on economic development here in Kansas City, where I live. And he served on a panel uh, back in February. It was the very first racial wealth gap symposium that Louise and I ha- held, and we held it here in my home city. And he was on a panel about real estate and about home ownership. And he said, you know, home ownership only really works if you're in an area that's seeing commercial economic investment Mm -hmm. so that the home values are going up. And I also think that that's, you know, part of the story too, when we look at, you know, have the areas where Black Americans have been able to own homes had economic investment. Right. Well, I mean, we know in Detroit, for instance, right. that they haven't, right? So so right. the neighborhoods that turn from white to black in the late 50s and early 60s uh, do so very quickly, right? Because uh, white Detroiters move out as mm-hmm. African Americans are moving in. And when those white Detroiters move out, they take with them the investment in businesses and commercial development Mm -hmm. that had defined those neighborhoods uh, before. And because African-Americans didn't have access to that capital, uh, to those resources, those neighborhoods changed. Those neighborhoods declined. Right. Uh, uh, So so uh, part of what – I guess part of what I'm struggling with here is is whether what we're talking about is – a modern problem uh, that that we need modern solutions to, current solutions mm-hmm. to, or mm-hmm. is it a, a, an historical problem that we've got to go back to that root and and and, and fix? Or I guess is it some combination of the two? I was just going to say it's both. I mean, it's both historical and modern. I think people need to understand the roots you know, before they can understand the problem and then before they can begin to think about solutions. So, you know, a lot of people don't know the statistic, 15 cents on the dollar, which Louise and I are working hard to make a nationally recognized statistic because we do think, I think if more people knew and understood this statistic and the history that wraps around it, that contributed to it being this I think it would influence decisions that people are making, discussions they're having about economic development, Mm -hmm. about affordable housing, about student loan debt, about education options, um, you know, for children. So it is it is both. And in the book, we also, you know, discuss factors that contribute to and hold the gap in place today. So. You know, I just want to mention, you know, following the housing uh, collapse of the financial crisis, the median black household had its wealth dropped by 53 percent, while the median white household's net worth dropped 16 percent. For those who are reading the book, that's page 153. (laughs) Now, (laughs) I had a little bit of my professor side come out, Stephen. (laughs) That's right. Turn to page 153. (laughs) (laughs) But but I think that's important for us to to understand that it is both modern and historical. I mean, Louise and I have a whole chapter on bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. You know, people might not think of bankruptcy as something that contributes to the black-white wealth gap, but when we looked at that system, white Americans are more likely to receive relief from their debt than black Americans. And whenever you have a system that's set up for one group of people to do better than the other, in this case, we're talking about white and black people, that will hold or widen the gap. And so we, you know, chronicle that and and we show through 
you know, the lives of the people in our book, like, you know, Michael Render, for example, who's known as Killer Mike. He's mm-hmm. a Grammy Award winning, you know, rapper. I don't want to give away too much <laughs> for anybody that's still reading. But, you know, we chronicle, um, you know, a bankruptcy filing that he had and what happens with his efforts. Yeah. Um, you know, also in this book, we have, you know, the most um, detailed historic um, you know, accounting of Andrew Young's family and his story, you know, and he is the former uh, mayor, people may remember, of Atlanta, sure. ambassador, longtime civil rights leader, worked with Dr. King. Um, and then we also have Andrew Glover, you know, who is a television executive. The three of them, founders of Greenwood Bank, which is a fintech, a banking effort, that had the stated mission to close the black white wealth gap um, in the summer of 2020. So in the book, we chronicle what happens with that effort. We also look at them and their family trees. Mm -hmm. And then we have four other black Americans that many people may not have heard of before they read. And these are people that either were their customers or fit the profile of people that they wanted to be their customers for this banking effort. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, you're, you're talking about, uh, the Greenwood bank, you're talking about, uh, Atlanta before we get too deeply in, into that and, and what happened, uh, with that effort, I, I, I want to spend a little time talking about Atlanta and why it's an important point of reference in, mm-hmm. in all of this. Uh, Atlanta is, um, in many ways, very different. I, I feel like from from other cities in terms of uh, the way that uh, that African American history and and uh, and current uh, life looks uh, there compared to other places. Um, but but there's a there are some specific reasons that for your work, Atlanta kind of stands out. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Atlanta has long been hailed the Black Mecca um, because of the opportunity sure. that it represented for Black Americans. You know, it had uh, has a long history of having, you know, Black mayors, um, you know, being a place where people, you know, have said if, you know, it would be a good place to go um, and make a living and have a life as a Black American. We have a chapter in the book on um, the two Atlantas and what we found in our reporting, what people told us, and you know, there's data to, to back it up. If you are a Black American who is wealthy or has a high income, it can be a great place to be. Mm-hmm. If you are a Black American who is economically struggling, um, if you are homeless, we, you know, talked with the the head of a homeless shelter there in Atlanta. There is a man in the book who's close to one of the main people that we focus on who is homeless. It's not a great place to be if you're, if you don't have money, if you don't have wealth and if you're black. Um, And so given that, that setting, you might expect that the gap, I guess, between black and white and Atlanta Looks different than other cities, as you point out. There's a lot of black wealth uh, in 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 Atlanta. Uh, talk about how that compares to this uh, 15 cents on the dollar standard that most Black Americans uh, are, are 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 living with. Well, what I can tell you is that um, this is that's a very interesting question because people have asked us about very geographic, granular mm-hmm. um, data on wealth in different um, geographic locations, and the Federal Reserve data actually doesn't break it out um, geographically. So, one of our um, recommendations when people get to the end of the book is that we encourage people to, um, you know, advocate. Think about how they can have conversations in their local communities that may result in more wealth transparency because the the data that we have, the 15 cents on the dollar that comes from the Federal Reserve, is from the consumer finance survey that the Federal Reserve does every three years. It doesn't break down the data by geographic regions. Hmm. So I actually can't tell you, you know, if Black Americans in Kansas City, where I live, or in Atlanta, or in Detroit, you know, what our wealth number is compared to other regions. Um, the data is also not broken down by gender. 
Um, we've received a lot of questions about that. Mm-hmm. So I can't say, um, you know, how it looks specifically for Black women, which is a question that I get often. But but Stephen, I do think you're on to something um, because when we look back at the 2008 crisis, the financial crisis, mm-hmm. you know, Atlanta was hit hard, just like Detroit was, just like Cleveland was, where I owned a home during that crisis. And um, coming out of that crisis, you know, there are people that had homes that lost them, that never re-entered into home ownership. Um, And there was a big impact on um, Black and Brown communities. And that even happened in Atlanta, you know, a place that's known as the Black Mecca. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's talk about this Greenwood Bank and its mission uh, and what it ultimately was able to accomplish in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, as a fintech, it's a a national effort. So people don't have to live in um, Atlanta to open an account. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, you know, we have it in the book that, you know, I – um, opens an account to see, you know, what it would be like, you know, to be a customer um, as a part of the research that Louise and I were doing. The customers had a lot of questions and they were clamoring for um, for loans, not just, um, you know, savings of uh, vehicles. And um, the fintech faced a lot of questions in the time that we were chronicling it from its customers. You know, fintechs have to partner with a traditional bank in order to offer services. And Greenwood partnered with um, a white bank, and there were questions about that from the customers about should it, could it have partnered with um, a black bank? And we cover that, you know, in the book and that whole discussion. Um, there were, were customers that wanted loans. Um, and, you know, wanted those products offered sooner. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it isn't easy to be um, an entrepreneurial effort. I think that in terms of the, the earliness of this, you know, banking effort, it's only a few years old. We don't yet know what the story will be, right? The yeah. complete story. It's still and the, being written. And the goal here is is what for our listeners? What, what what's the well, idea? Well they they say their stated mission is to close, you know, the black white wealth gap. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we explored in the reporting around that is close it for who? And I think that's a really important question yeah. for people to ask whatever the effort is. You know, um when people say that they're trying to close, you know, a wealth gap or close an income gap or close a housing gap, like who are they trying to close it for? Because it is true that you could close the black white wealth gap by focusing just on high um, net worth or Mm -hmm. high income black Americans and not service the entire distribution. And so, you know, that is one of the challenges, you know, that we hear from the customers that are raising questions, you know, about, you know, the banking effort, you know, the 15 on the cents, I should say this statistic is true in the median, which is the entire distribution. And it is also true in the mean, which is the average. And I want to underscore that because the statistic is not always the same exact number in, you know, both, um, you know, calculations. And one of the common questions that Louise and I receive from people is whether or not this gap would exist if all of the billionaires who are mostly white are removed from the data. Hmm. And the answer to that is yes, the gap would still exist because if we look over at the median and if we kick out, you know, 20, 40 people or whatever, the, the, the typical white family still has um, $1 in wealth where the typical black family has 15 cents. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue this really great conversation with uh, Ebony Reed about the black-white wealth gap. We'll be right back with more Created Equal.
This is Created Equal from WDET in Detroit. I'm Stephen Henderson, and I'm talking with Ebony Reed. She is a chief strategy officer for the Marshall Project. She's a lecturer at the Yale School of Management and co-author of a new book titled 15 Cents on the Dollar, How Americans Made the Black-White Wealth Gap. Um, uh, Ebony, I want to talk a little about fixes uh, and change um, but I want to talk about it from a, a kind of specific perspective. I, I think there are a lot of people who might look at all of this data and and read your book and say, well, you know, black people have had enough time to 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 catch up, right? That that there isn't any more effort that that's needed to to level the playing field. This is about effort, and this is about um, you know uh, consistency and and community building. And so, African Americans should be principally responsible for for taking care of this. Uh, you know, yeah, that's go ahead. In- that's interesting, Stephen, because one of the people that we interviewed in the book, um, you know, Andrew Young's son said he thinks that it's the responsibility of white people of to white fix people. this problem yes. because, you know, white people created this. Um, it is, it so, is so the, let's talk about the tension between those two things, right? R- Inside right. the black community and outside of it. You know, there, we were very intentional with the sub um, title of our book, how Americans mm. made the black white mm. wealth gap, because there were decisions that people made that created and contributed to this gap. Um, when we spoke in the last, you know, segment about you know Atlanta and the experience of wealthier and higher income Black Americans versus those who have less, you know, part of that tension is like you like you said, like whose responsibility is it to fix it? Mm-hmm. Um, people often ask us, is it, you know, a problem the government created or the private sector? The answer to that is both. You know, um, it is a problem that isn't going away anytime soon unless people make the decision that they want to do things to fix it. And it is such a complex, you know, issue to address. I think of it as a spider web. Mm -hmm. Like once you start looking at all of the things that intersect home ownership, banking, education, the court system, you know, it is a very... um, complicated issue to address, but it is the result of many, you know, many decisions that were made in our country over time. So it is a complex issue. I want to throw some statistics out to you from a calculation that um, Louise did, because Mm -hmm. I think that this kind of speaks to this whole thing about, you know, is it my problem? Should I care about (laughs) it? You know, like, Okay, so if the black-white wealth gap ratio continues closing in coming years at the rate that it did from 1989 until 2022, the length of time that it would take to reach one-to-one ratio, meaning parity, black Americans on the same level as white Americans Mm -hmm. with wealth, we're looking at 291 years. Wow. Wow. If the black-white wealth ratio increases at the rate it did from 2013 until 2022. So that's after we had the financial cri- uh, the economic you know financial crisis in our country. The time it would take to reach one to one ratio is 120 years. Hmm. If the black white wealth ratio increases at the pace it did from 2019, so right before the pandemic until 2022, it would take roughly 91 years. And that's if like, Things just, you know, continue going the way they are. And so I think, you know, we think it's important that people understand this data and the impact on real people living today. You know, that's why Louise and I, you know, came together to do this book. We were colleagues at the Wall Street Journal in the summer of 2020. Like many Americans, we were having conversations about things we'd seen in our country and our lifetimes and workplaces. And we thought, you know what can we do? And we started reading books together and having conversations. And we realized that there is no book that exists that is the complete history of the black-white wealth gap in our country Mm -hmm. to present day with real contemporary people living today. And so that's why we did this book. Um, 
And I hope people, you know, care about this issue and I hope that they'll want to read the book and help us spread the data. You know, for us, this book is more than just a book. It's a public impact project. Yeah. So like I mentioned, we've been traveling the country since February, talking to people across the country in communities and small and large groups. We've been in museums, churches, um, you know, um, community centers. We've been in people's homes to help educate people about this. Louise has pledged um, all of her book profits, um, and I have pledged a share of mine to nonprofits that focus on women empowerment, hmm. education, and journalism with the lens on Black Americans. So this is not a money-making effort for right. us. <laughs> right. This is a spread the data. This is a public service project, public. right? <laughs> yes, this is a public service. Yes. So, so, so I, I want to have you talk about how this fits into the narrative of reparations, which has gained an enormous amount of momentum in some ways in the last decade or so. Uh, and there are cities, including Detroit, that are making real efforts to, to at least try mm -hmm. to document the need for something like reparations. And we haven't mm -hmm. gotten to the point yet where we're able to define what that looks like and, mm -hmm. and what, would, what would work or what would make a difference. So I'm really curious, though, given the research that you're doing and have done and have put into this book, when you hear that word, reparations, um, what kind of things come to to mind, what 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 kinds of policies or programs do you think could shrink this this gap as a as a reparative effort to the things that uh, that Black Americans you know that we've suffered for so long? Well, you know, in this book, Louise and I have data and human stories, and we don't make policy recommendations. We think that this is a book that can be read by people and should be read by people of all political spectrums, beliefs, and backgrounds. So, you know, the policymaking, I'll leave that to the politicians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a, as a journalist, I won't wade into that. But, you know, what I will say is that um, we do um, chronicle and cover towards the end of the book that there are many reparations efforts and studies underway across the country. Um, we spent time talking with people who are working on a task force down in Fulton County, you know, Georgia. Also talked with people that have experimented with things like, um, you know, a minimum living wage out in Stockton, California. Um, I've been told by people who are focused, um, you know, in this area that our book is helpful in that um, it has history, data, and people's stories. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, I, I don't think the conversation about reparations is going away. Um, and I think that the fact that, you know, on the low end, you know, we're looking at 91 years, if nothing changes <laughs> right, for right. the Black-White wealth gap to reach parity, I think that, you know, people will be talking about this for a long time and talking about what can be done. I mean, Stephen, that means that in our lifetimes, the black white wealth gap will not disappear. It won't, it won't go away. Uh, yeah. Maybe even, you know, my children who are uh, right. getting into their early twenties, they might not be around for, for, for any of that. So, so let me ask that question though, a different way. Um, can you think of things that so one of the one of the tensions when we talk about reparations I think is between things that would make things better in the short term uh, and things that would fundamentally change the trajectory going forward. So so for instance, I have this kind of fantasy idea about uh, paying off people's mortgages, right? Giving people instantly a hundred percent equity in the home that they are, are working to own as, uh, as a fundamental shift, right, in, in wealth, in wealth accumulation uh, and in inherited wealth. I mean, all kinds of things that would happen if, if you could do that. That's really different from giving somebody a check, even if it's a check for $100,000. Uh, the, 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 the gap between... Um, 
you know, uh, a, a cash payment, for instance, or or something that changes your life uh, is one of the things I think we kind of have to think about when we talk about things like reparations. I'm just curious, again, from the research that you're doing, where you where you see that tension Mm-hmm. Uh, playing out. Mm-hmm. We do um, have a section in the book where we um, quote from the work of some researchers that have looked at, um, you know, if a reparation payment or a, lump, a large lump sum of cash was made to Black families to put them on um, a more equitable wealth footing with white Americans. Mm-hmm. And what they found in their work was that it would only make a difference for a short while. Yeah. It would not close the gap ultimately because we have all of these systems in the country where um, the gap would ultimately reemerge. And so we have, you know, an um, labor market where black Americans are one and a half to two times more likely to be unemployed. We, um, you know, we, we have differences in our civil and criminal justice systems. Um, we, you know, we're looking at differences in um, people's abilities for education. So all of these things, these systems that are in our society would ultimately um, recreate the gap. So, you know, I think that the data and the interviews from the people um, you know, raise questions about, you know, whether or not anyone could fix the gap, yeah. you know, without real serious evaluation and changes in many systems. And that comes from the people that we interviewed, you know, what, what they are saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Ebony Reed, uh, it was really great to have it you. It was great to have you. And you know home what? Home in I wanna, Detroit. <laughs> well, listen, I, I want to mention too, you know, I spent four great years as a, a editor at the Detroit News. Yes. Um, you know, while my parents moved there in the 80s, I was a small child. So I am a proud alum of Southfield Public Schools oh, right there, there in the go. community. <laughs> so, you know, I have to give a, a, a shout out to... Um, to the Detroit community because uh, a lot of my journalism skill was, you know, developed there. And I, I, uh, I thank you for having me. So, you know, one thing that Ebony brought up here that really stood out for me was when she talked about going into uh, looking closely at Atlanta. Well, one, well, particularly the fact that they even added the narrative voices to their book and talked about individual anecdotes I thought was fascinating. But then to also be in Atlanta and, and look at a city that has um, more a, a larger population of a middle or black class and see how folks who are attempting to close the gap end up actually benefiting just the folks, the higher earners within the black community. I yeah, thought it was that interesting. Yeah, one of the, that's one of the, the kind of uh, dynamics that, that emerges from, you out. know, trying to do this. And, yeah. and there's a real question about how you build wealth for people right. who are really at the, at the beginning stages of it, yeah. right? Um, and how you would catch them up to people of the same race mm-hmm. who, who have it's more. The catcher. Yeah. Um, I think the, the key though is to, is to look at, Opportunity, making sure that everybody has the same opportunity to build that wealth, uh, and and over time, if you make that true, then the outcomes will not uh, reflect bias, right? But doesn't that sound like equal versus equity? And this goes back to one of our earlier conversations. Well, again. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think equity is uh, about making sure that everybody has the same opportunity, right? Um, you're not going to create at, at equal, right, right? But you're not going to create equal outcomes in a society that is not um, that that doesn't have a socialist economy, right? Right, uh, right, it's, right. It's, right. A, it's a capitalist economy where 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 all kinds of uh, differences are going to emerge about individual performance. What you don't want is that individual performance to be overshadowed by bias. Uh, I think I understand. You're saying given our current economic system, this is the extent to which we could offer folks who are not as wealthy an opportunity to build some sort of wealth. Right. You want to eliminate the reason for people being poor 
the fact that the, from being the fact that they're black. Uh, uh, it, you know, there are going to always be people who aren't wealthy who are black. There should be uh, there there should there shouldn't be a, a a group of people who are not wealthy because they are black. Right. That's it for this episode of Created Equal. Created Equal is produced by Kerry Jr. II and David Lines. The audio editing is by Connor Anderson, and the music is by Sam Bobian. Created Equal is a production of WDET, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University.